Good evening, I'm Maureen Luddy, and on behalf of my husband, David, and our son, Noah, we want to welcome you to the second lecture in the hist on the history of hatred, which is part of the Luddy Lecture Series, in honor of my beloved parents, Mort of Blessed Memory and Claire Commissar. My parents taught me to live life fully and have a passion for life and learning. Last week, 228 unique devices were logged into the Zoom with multiple people watching from many of them. Some people already knew Dr. Crane and were thrilled to hear him again. And for those of you who experienced Dr. Crane for the first time, you now understand why my parents followed him from place to place to hear him lecture. And to Dr. Crane, I'm so appreciative for the time and effort you're putting into these presentations. Last week, we covered over 2,000 years of history in an hour. Thanks to the JCC and all of the co-sponsors for allowing us to be socially and intellectually connected, even if we are currently physically distanced. Thanks to each of you who are joining us tonight. Thanks to Tony Davis and Levenberg, who's handling the technology tonight, and to Jody Hirsch for moderating the questions. Take it away. Good evening. And welcome back uh, for part two of our three-part presentation. And what I'd like to do just briefly uh, is to address two questions that came up um, on our last presentation. And uh, for a little bit of clarification, we'll have some time as, as well at the end uh, to, to discuss some more um, or any new questions that you may have. The first involves here the crucifixion. And, and just to, to clarify, to make abundantly clear, the Romans killed Jesus, okay? The Romans killed Jesus. If you look at it, as we were discussing last time, the impression is given as Jesus is being handed over to them to be crucified. But it's a classic Roman form of execution. If the Jews were gonna kill Jesus, he would have been stoned. He would have not been crucified. Uh, and also adding in that, there were other gospels that of course don't make the final cut, the gospel of Q, the gospel of Thomas, the reason they weren't included is due to the fact that most of what they said was already uh, already in Mark, Matthew, or Luke in particular, the Synoptic Gospels, so it was a bit overly redundant um, in that sense. Finally, to clarify as well, in terms of the Pharisees, they were the group looking for the Messiah, and in this situation, it's imperative to understand that the vast majority of Jews here in Judea, or what the Romans referred to as Palestina, really were not interested in Messiah. That wasn't uh, uh, at the focal point or the centerpiece. The second issue came up in terms of Islamic civilization. We'll get into in part three of our series, we'll talk about anti-Semitism in the Middle East, which of course is very, very prevalent in the present day, no doubt about that. But it is also important to understand that for the most part, Bernard Lewis talks about this extensively, it is exported from Europe to the Middle East. There's no doubt you're going to find countless examples here of Muslims killing Jews in the uh, late Middle Ages or early modern period. No doubt about this. Uh, there's a, a good many examples. However, it's also imperative to understand, we get into, for example, this evening, 1917 to 1921 in Russia, you have the uh, uh, Imperial Russians here at the time of the first of the First World War and then continue on with the Russian Revolution and the Russian Civil War slaughtering over 60,000 Jews. We have the Holocaust, of course, as well, which takes the, life of near, the lives of nearly 6 million Jews. This happens in Europe. It happens here in Europe exclusively. Europe is in a league all its own, simply in terms of murder rate, etc., as we'll talk about. By the same end, in terms of the Crusades, yes, there were issues going back and forth between the, between the Christians and the Muslims. When Islamic civilization spreads, they cross the Straits of Gibraltar as they have uh, already expanded significantly in the late 600s throughout the Middle East as well as North Africa. They cross the Straits of Gibraltar, they're into Southern Spain. The expansion continues into uh, all the year to all the way to the year 732 at the Battle of Tours, Charles Martel defeats the Muslim forces, and it begins a Reconquista, pushing them back into southern Spain. So in essence, what we find here at this time period is we see, yes, indeed, with the Crusades beginning, it is launched by the Christians in 1095. And it really causes significant harm to the relationship, not just between Christians and Muslims, but also Christians and Jews. 
well, to formally begin. From the standpoint of our last time, we referenced this phenomena of anti-Judaism. And I stress the fact that Christianity should have been, it should have been the greatest protector of its sister religion. But not only did it fail to protect, at times it became here its greatest persecutor. We saw this in the Crusades in 1095 when they begin, the Black Death, which starts in 1347, these accusations of Jewish ritual murder, which are gonna continue all the way into the 20th century. We see it in the Spanish Inquisition of 1483 in this glimmer of hope because Orthodox Christianity and Roman Catholicism had a tremendous amount of luggage, tremendous amount of baggage in terms of this anti-Judaism. The Protestant Reformation of 1517 offered to the Jews of Europe this glimmer of hope. Well, unfortunately, that didn't work out either, as we saw in 1543, when Martin Luther pens the most anti-Semitic document in all of history on the Jews and their lies. Well, from the perspective here of the Jews, what we see is a population, about 1% of the population in historic Europe, that is routinely expelled from all sorts of different nations. For example, Jews were expelled from England in 1290. They were expelled from France in 1394, as well, of course, in Spain, as we talked about last time, the single largest Jewish population in the world at that time, expelled from Spain about 300,000 here in 1492. Jews were not allowed to own land in Europe. It is a case that eventually they're going to be forced to live in ghettos, which will be overwhelmingly dominant in the Italian city-states as well as the Germanic land or the historic region of Central Europe, but also stretching as well into uh, uh, Western Europe. And churches across Europe categorically refused. They refused for Christians, they were not allowed to lend money, lend money for profit. And money lending thus, for the European Jews, this tiny population in historic European civilization was one of the few, one of the few professions, quite frankly, that was open. This usury is what it's oftentimes referred to as. Well, what this did in Europe is it led, as we get into the 1500s and we're moving forward, it led to a whole new set of stereotypes. The Jews were greedy, they were manipulative, they were money hungry. The Jew would do anything he could to get his hands on money. Well, as the years progress and we get into the late 1600s, we see this birth of the Enlightenment, this intellectual awakening, thank God, quite frankly, because the Dark Ages, the Middle Ages certainly didn't represent a great deal of progress. Islamic civilization had been the centerpiece of the globe from the 700s into the early 1100s, European civilization with the onset of the agricultural revolution became here all the more prominent, in fact, the dominant civilization until into the early 1900s. But the enlightenment serves to really shake things up in a positive way. This focus on realism, on individualism, as opposed to tradition and superstition, and in this rebirth, in this rebirth, Jews became even more prominent in terms of getting involved really in the establishment of early banking. And there was greater levels of tolerance shown towards them at the upper levels of society, shown here at the upper levels of society by monarchies in particular, because some of these Jewish families, about 2%, maybe 5% of the Jewish population as a whole in Central and Western Europe, some of these Jewish families could in fact help finance the construction of new cathedrals. They could help finance, more importantly, wars for these different kings and queens. And we see this enlightened leader, this enlightened despot, Frederick the Great in 1740, here who oversees the large Germanic state of Prussia. And as king of Prussia, he also is facing one of the largest Jewish ghettos in all of Europe, the Berlin ghetto. And here he will set the stage allowing for if these Jewish families, 1%, 2%, 3% of these ghetto families will help him 
if they will help him finance his wars or whatever he is looking to need help with in terms of financing, he would let them out of the ghetto. They could come out and live with the rest of the population because it was a double-edged sword for the Jews. It was a sense here you were cut off and isolated in these ghettos. Yet by the same token, you were then accused of being clannish. You were damned if you do, damned if you don't, quite frankly. And here with Frederick the Great, we see this first step, this first step in the enlightenment towards a more equal society, a baby step, but nevertheless a step. Well, as the 1700s come to an end, Napoleon Bonaparte will take things a step further. Napoleon Bonaparte, for all intents and purposes, is this child of the enlightenment. And from his perspective, in his nation of France, he has a Jewish population of 40,000, about 1% of the population here of France. And what he's interested in is granting them citizenship, granting them civil rights, because wherever the Jews settled, if they were allowed in a nation, wherever they settled, they were always looked upon as foreigners, as outsiders. And from the standpoint of Napoleon, he sought to change this, but he takes his, one of his court ministers, Count Molay, to call out to the Jews in Paris and assemble here this assembly of Jewish notables and ask a number of questions. One of the questions was, for example, are Jews Frenchmen first or are they Jews first? Well, the answer there was easy coming from the Jewish notables. We've lived in France for generations. Quite frankly here, we are Frenchmen who practice a religion different from mainstream French society, which is Catholicism. We practice a religious faith of Judaism. Is a follow-up to that, question came up, one of the other questions was, can a Jew marry a non-Jew? Well, that's a little trickier. And the response to Napoleon's question here through Count Molay and coming directly, of course, from the assembly of Jewish notables is that although it is not encouraged, certainly, it is not forbidden. There were other questions too tying in with this. At the end, Napoleon was satisfied. And what he does in 1807 is he formally grants Jewish emancipation. This is awesome. The enlightenment, the child of the enlightenment has come through once again, as far as the French Jews are concerned. Now they can travel freely. In some places there were very uh, strong travel restrictions, other places not so much, but in France there had been. Now you can travel freely, you can purchase a home, you can practice any religion, I should say rather any profession you choose. This was big and the hope, the hope, on the part of the French Jews is that this would have an effect like a snowball effect across all of Western Europe. And finally, we would be able to, centuries later, to assimilate into European society. Well, as Napoleon's Grand Army pushed off into Central Europe, expanding this French empire to the largest extent ever, he would encounter here in the Italian city-states, these seven distinct Italian units, all of these ghettos. The first ghetto, of course, was in Venice. And these ghettos would be effectively declared illegal. Jews would no longer have to live in the ghetto, would no longer have to be obviously second class, okay? at least not in terms of reality of living cut off from the rest of the population. He did the same in the Germanic lands. He did the same here in the Germanic lands. This represented the hope, the hope for a new dawn in the Jewish experience in Europe. Unfortunately, however, it represented a false dawn. In Western Europe, 20% of the Jewish population in all of Europe resided. In Eastern Europe, the Jews of Eastern Europe, they represented a full 80% of the Jewish population of Europe. In fact, if you wanna put it on a larger framework, in the 19th century, the East European Jewish population represented 75%, 75% of the Jews of the entire planet. So large was this population. But here, you're not going to have any uh, money lending going on, at least not compared to what had been the case with the peddlers and the ghettos in Central and Western Europe. Here, these Jews are these dirt poor peasant farmers trying to eke out an existence on a day-to-day -day basis. And despite the enlightenment impacting Western Europe, it did not have such a large impact at all in Eastern Europe. 
the Russian Orthodox Christian population in 19th century Europe saw here Jews as Christ killers, as ritual murderers. As far as they're concerned, that's not medieval, obscurantist, passe, that's reality. That's the present day here in Russia. By the same end, they consistently referred to them as parasites. This was true across the entire society, the entire empire, all the way up to the czars themselves. Well, the Jews of Russia lived in the historic Pale Settlement. And as the 19th century progressed, the problem here is that they were uh, vulnerable to assaults, to being murdered, quite frankly. And wave after wave of attacks of murderous assaults would be launched here in the Pale Settlement on the East European Jews. They represented in the Pale Settlement about 20% of the population living in these small towns, small hamlets throughout. To a very real extent, uh, the image of Fiddler on the Roof, and without the singing and dancing, I suppose, uh, uh, was very much a part here of what the East European Pale Settlement Jewish experience was. Well, what happens? What happens is this new word is ushered into the Russian vocabulary pogrom, and the Jews are going to continue to be scapegoated, blamed for all the problems in historic Russia. Well, in 1881, Tsar Alexander II is assassinated. He is assassinated, and he will be replaced by his son, Alexander III. Now, Alexander II was assassinated by this organization known as the People's Will. And the People's Will had a number of different groups involved here. But Alexander III, as far as he is concerned, the problem here is with the Jews. And in this situation, Alexander III is going to basically order pogrom after pogrom to rain down upon the Jews throughout the Pale Settlement because he accuses the People's Will of being this Jewish industry. Well, there are some Jews in the People's Will, but they represent a tiny fraction of the population. The scapegoating continues. And in 1882, in 1882, the May laws are passed. The May laws are going to strip the Jews in the Pale Settlement virtually any rights they have. You leave your town or village, you can never return. And in essence, that's just the tip of the iceberg. It's a very, very difficult situation. And what happens here for these East European Jews, as far as they're concerned, the only option they have is pogroms here still become very, very common over the course, especially the last two decades of the 19th century. The only option they have is to leave, to move, to emigrate. And they will emigrate to Western Europe as well as the United States. The vast majority of Jewish Americans are descendants, of course, of the East European Jews. Well, the significance here, they also will go to South Africa, they will go as well to Palestine. The significance here, the significance here is one of this hope in Western Europe. If you compared it across the way to Eastern Europe, it's a night and day difference. There's really no hope there. It's a very, very serious situation. Well, here in Europe, as the 19th century begins to come to an end, you have this introduction of this new phenomenon. And the birth of modern anti-Semitism comes forth from the nation of Germany. Now, as Americans, we're considered here uh, as a very new nation. Eh? The United States, very new nation. It's a case here for the US 1776 and all that especially if you compare it to nations around the world, especially in historic Europe. Well, Germany as a nation is not born until 1871. 1871. And it is this surge of nationalism that takes place. The Germans have a chip on their shoulder. They've been treated in a second-class fashion as far as they're concerned by the two great European powers, Britain and France. And they're not going to take it anymore. Well, with this surge of German nationalism, as Germany is going to formally be able to unify itself in 1871, you also have, in the words of Hannah Arendt in her work, Origins of Totalitarianism, this surge of anti-Semitism. The Jew as the outsider, as the person, the individual who does not belong, the parasite. And you have all these pseudo-scientists, these anti-Semitic theorists, the first of whom is George von Schoenerer, 
who as far as the theorists are concerned, the Jews were only after money and power. That's all that drove them, that's all that concerned them. George von Schaner argued Germany for the Germans. What did it mean to be a German as far as von Schaner was concerned? Well, this nation was roughly half Protestant, half Catholic. If you're a Protestant or Catholic, you're a German. It is directed at the Jews. If you're not Protestant, Catholic, get out. You're not a German. Karl Luger, another anti-Semitic theorist, he's from Austria. He's the mayor of Vienna, elected office a number of times. He would use anti-Semitism here as a political platform. He would say to the Viennese, to the lower middle class, the working class in particular, I feel your pain. I feel your pain. Many of you are unemployed. You have no hope. It's a very difficult situation. I want you to know. I know what you're going through, and it's not your fault. It is the fault of the Jew. Luger argues, you put me in power, I promise you, I will get rid of this Jewish influence in Vienna and outside, wherever it may be. He uses this as a very effective political platform. Richard Wagner, the great German composer, was also a rabid anti-Semite. Wagner wanted to free Germany from this Jewish menace. For God's sakes, the German Jewish population in the late 19th century was less than 1%. Free them? What, what are you talking about? Well, Richard Wagner stressed here that the German people needed to stay away from the Jews or face racial pollution. Houston Stuart Chamberlain, who's from Britain, he is heavily influenced by Wagner. In fact, he will marry Richard Wagner's daughter. Houston Stewart Chamberlain believed in the Aryan Superman, the tall, blonde-haired, blue-eyed Germanic male, who would marry the tall, blonde-haired, blue-eyed Germanic female. And together they'd have the perfect master race, the Aryan. He would stress in his writings, Chamberlain, that Jesus was not a Jew. Rather, he was an Aryan. He also stressed that Jews sought to undermine our racial purity in our new nation of Germany. And we had to, as Germans, attack the deviant Jew. Attack the deviant Jew or face elimination. Well, Chamberlain had this racial pyramid, as oftentimes always referred to, also referred to as this racial tree. And at the very top, the creme de la creme were the Aryans, just underneath the Aryan master race were the Germanic people set to rule the world. Just underneath the Germanic race were the Anglo-Saxons, the British. They also originally hailed from historic, hailed here from the historic Germanic lands. And the rock bottom, just above, I should say, the rock bottom were blacks. Not surprisingly, many anti-Semites are also racist. I know, stunning news. You heard it from me first, I'd suppose. The rock bottom of the barrel, the Jew. And what made the Jews so dangerous as far as Chamberlain was concerned is that if you look at them, they look like they're human, but it's inside. It, what, it's what you cannot see. There, in fact, represents the danger. Wilhelm Marr, a failed German journalist, he coined the term in 1879, anti-Semite. Herman Albert another failed German journalist. He believed, he argued here in this international Jewish conspiracy where the Jews were seeking ultimately to rule the world. Well, for the Jews of Western Europe, everything was okay, provided that the economy was stable. But in the rise here of capitalism, of course, as we'd already know, living in a capitalist society, you have the ebb and flow, you have a strong economy, you also end up here by the same token with uh, economies that, that go into recession. Well, for the Jews of Western Europe, it was okay as long as the economy was decent, but if a recession hit, a recession hit, it was very, very tough because the Jews would be held, they would be blamed, they would be scapegoated here in the supposedly advanced Western Europe. This entity that had gone through the enlightenment, some decades before. But with this rise of European nationalism, and not just in Germany, but also in France, in Britain, across the entire landscape, there too arose Jewish nationalism. 
Jewish nationalism, better known as Zionism. Zionism is the quest for a Jewish homeland, a quest here for a Jewish homeland. And it has its origins in the Pale Settlement in Russia, no surprise there. As far as the Jews of the Pale Settlement are concerned, until we have our own nation, we're not gonna be left alone. We have to have a safety zone, a safety net somewhere in the world. And no matter where we settle, no matter where we move to, we're going to be viewed here as second class, as outsiders. Well, you have these lovers of Zion organizations coming forth in Eastern Europe. But for this movement to really get off the ground, you need the support of the West European Jews. They're better educated from a socioeconomic standpoint. They're far better off. You need them on board. And the West European Jews, despite this rise of modern anti-Semitism, their attitude is, we don't want to rock the boat. This is a flash in the pan, passing phase. And you see here an individual who is going to come forth with these West European roots, even though he's born in Budapest, in 1860, Theodore Herzl. Now, Herzl, Herzl is from a fully assimilated, a fully assimilated Jewish family. And what he wants here, he begins his life as a, a journalist. He sees his great talent as, as writing, really his great talent is politics. The guy's got it down to an art form, no doubt about that. But what happens here is in 1894, in 1894, Herzl, who is very much aware of these pogroms in Eastern Europe and troubled by them, but sees Western Europe as the exception. He is sent from Vienna, his home city, to Paris to report on the Dreyfus Affair. Now, the Dreyfus Affair, the Dreyfus Affair centered on a Jewish captain in the French army, Captain Alfred Dreyfus. And Captain Dreyfus, Captain Dreyfus was significant in that he was the first Jewish officer ever in the history of the French army. The British had an obsession historically with their great navy. The French had the obsession with their great army. Well, Dreyfus, Dreyfus is accused in 1894 of selling military secrets to Germany. Uh, the accusation made little sense, and there's going to be a trial coming forth. Herzl's going to come from Vienna to Paris to report on it. And it made very little sense here that this 35-year-old Dreyfus was selling military secrets to the Germans because, first and foremost, he was from a very wealthy family in Alsace-Lorraine. He didn't, he didn't need the money. Second of all, second of all, he was married with three little kids. Why, why would you take this risk? What if you get caught? And third, he is an ardent French nationalist, an ardent French nationalist. Nevertheless, he is found guilty of treason and he is sentenced to life imprisonment off in the middle of nowhere on Devil's Island to never be heard from again. Well, before he leaves for this life imprisonment, Herzl is there and he is watching the events as they unfold. And what he sees here is the French mob behind him saying, kill the Jew, kill all the Jews. They're the reason for everything that is wrong in France. Get rid of this dirty Jew. And Herzl would write about this later. And he said he felt like he was Jewish living back in the Middle Ages. And it dawned on him at that moment that this anti-Semitism, it's not going away. And the only solution, the only solution is for there to be for there to be a Jewish state. And it will be with this Dreyfus affair, which is going to lead him towards writing what becomes the foundation for the Zionist movement, written in his primary language, the language of German, Der Judenstadt, or the Jewish state, where he expands here on this vision. And you have in the aftermath, you have these Zionist Congresses being set up. And you see the real gifts of Herzl as a politician. And on August 29th, 1897, the first Zionist Congress would be held in Basel, Switzerland. 
where it'll be discussed where should just Jewish state be? It's not immediately settled on Palestine. In fairness, Herzl believed, he believed that Palestine may not have been the best choice. Psychologically, it made the best choice, made the most sense, no doubt about that. But perhaps Argentina, because it was lightly populated, had agricultural possibilities, potentialities, because you want to get these East European Jews out of harm's way, if at all possible. Well, in 1903, the British, who are very sympathetic to the Zionist movement and are horrified, politicians and intellectuals, with this modern anti-Semitism, the British are going to offer up Uganda in Africa, part of the British Empire in Africa, as a Jewish state. Well, as far as the delegates are concerned in Eastern Europe, we have no claim to Uganda any more than we do Argentina. The only place for us to go is Palestine. Herzl believes that this is an absolute necessity and he is 100% correct. There are no other options, no other options. And it will be at the same time that the protocols of the elders of Zion here in 1903 are going to come forth. They're a fabricated anti-Semitic text that described, described a Jewish plan for world domination. Now, this is so ridiculous and so laughable. Think about this tiny population, the Jews, gonna rule the world. Yeah, right, sure. The problem here is the dangers that are associated with this right across the board. Well, with the protocols of the elders of Zion, it ended up being translated into many languages and it was continued, it continued to be circulated, continued to be circulated up to and including the present day and certainly was circulated after, after it was a proven forgery, proven to be a forgery in 1921. So you have here a situation that what Herzl and the Zionists are facing, it's a tough road. It's an uphill struggle. There's no doubt about that whatsoever. But it is also an absolute necessity. It is an absolute necessity for Herzl envisions a 20th century being even worse than the 19th century for the European Jews. Sadly and tragically, in 1904, Theodor Herzl suffers a massive heart attack and dies. And the Zionist movement lost this dedicated voice. There would be other excellent followers, I should say other excellent leaders to follow. But Herzl, the question oftentimes is what may have happened had he lived? You see this oftentimes with people who die entirely too young of lives unfulfilled. Well, as the 20th century progressed, as the 20th century progressed here, you have more and more trouble looming on the horizon. Here across historic Europe, the war clouds begin to roll. And there's this glorification, there's this romanticizing of war. In 1815, Napoleon Bonaparte was defeated at the Battle of Waterloo. And this Napoleonic era, this huge scourge, as far as all nations were concerned in Europe, unless you were in France, comes to an end. And Europe, for the most part, will have large-scale peace all the way into the 20th century for 99 years. But as the early 20th century begins, nationalism continues to grow. This whole attitude of my nation is the best, superior to all other nations. By the same token across the European landscape, military alliances would set up here this really bipolar Europe. The Europeans forgot, generations later, the horrors of war, the absolute horrors of war. I guarantee you this, if they had thought about it for a moment, they would have stopped, turned around, and walked away. Well, all it's going to take here is a spark to start World War I. And on June 28, 1914, the assassination of the heir to the Austro-Hungarian throne, Archduke Francis Ferdinand, literally, the dominoes are going to fall into place, and we will have the onset of this great war. The central powers, Germany, Austria, Hungary, Bulgaria, and the Ottoman Empire against the allied powers, 
Britain, France, and Russia at the outset. For Jews living especially in Western Europe, this was an opportunity. Everybody going into this war believed in the European nations. They believed here, whether you're Jewish or not Jewish, made no difference. This war was gonna be short, first of all. And second of all, your side was going to be victorious. Jews fought valiantly for the British army, for the French army, for the German army here in the First World War. It was an opportunity in particular for German Jews, German Jews who were about 500,000 of the population of about 74 million in Germany here at this time to show their loyalty to Deutschland. They saw themselves as Germans, plain and simple. Take into consideration the following, nearly 100,000 German Jews served the German army in the First World War. Of those, 12,000 German Jews were killed. 18,000, 18,000 German Jews received Germany's highest commendation. They were awarded the Iron Cross, 18,000 completely out of proportion to the rest of the population, whether they were Catholic or Protestant. Amazing, impressive. It was an opportunity here to show you belonged, to look beyond this past of blatant discrimination, and in many cases, outright murder. Well, here, the war would be won or lost on the Western Front. You can see in the lower corner, well, first in Northern France, you can see the box there on our overhead slide. And by the same end here, if you go to the lower corner, you see the Western Front in a much larger framework. Well, the Western Front was the most important front in this multi-front war for whoever won the Western Front was gonna win the war, was in fact gonna win the war. And it would pit Britain and France on one side against the German army on the other side. World War I would take the lives of 15 million people. And by the time we get to, by the time we get to 1917, for all intents and purposes, this war appears as though it's headed to a stalemate permanently. Neither side can get the upper hand. The Russian front, the Italian front, the Dardanelles Balkans front, but especially here, the Western front. But, outright truce was simply not possible. Well, the United States would effectively join the Allied side here in World War I. They would join the Allied side, and this was significant because the United States' this up and coming industrial power itself by 1915 was the world's predominant power. This European domination from the 1100s all the way into the early 1900s had formally come to an end. The torch had been passed across the Atlantic Ocean to the Americans. And with the United States here joining, your British soldiers on the Western Front, joining the war effort in this war of goods, once you throw manufacturing, the United States is down to an art form here at this stage, in this war of goods, uh, the, the Americans had been financing a great deal of the war for Britain and France. Uh, they had been supplying them. It was huge, not just in terms of weaponry, but the farmers and across the United States is huge market, new market in terms of grain production, sending that across to the uh, populations in Western Europe and the Allied side. And what it does here with the American involvement is it tips the scales in favor of the Allies. All hope is lost for Germany and the Central Powers. And with no other options, the German high command under the leadership of Eric Ludendorff and Paul von Hindenburg asked the Allies for the terms of an armistice or an agreement to stop fighting. And the armistice is formally signed on November 11th, 1918. And this terrible war, the most horrific war in human history up to that time comes to an end. From the standpoint of Germany, there's this extraordinary shock. How could we have lost this war? 
First and foremost, the Germans have been told throughout the war that they're winning. We're winning. All we need is just a little bit more time, a little bit more sacrifice. We're going to march on Paris. We're just 40 miles from it. You've got to believe we will prevail, and we will prevail. Now suddenly we're being told we lost the war. It was a stab in the back, as far as the Germans were concerned. It had to be some sort of conspiracy within that brought about our supposed defeat. What added here to this myth, the Germans really didn't lose the war, was the fact that not one Allied soldier set foot on German soil the entire war, not one. How could we lose a war fighting here by the traditional rules of European warfare if we weren't even invaded? Berlin is still alive and well, our capital city. It doesn't make any sense. It does not make any sense. Well, for the Germans, the Treaty of Versailles would be yet another bitter pill to swallow, which was given to them in 1919 as diktat, or dictated peace, as far as the Germans were concerned. And two clauses, reparations, they were going to have to pay $34 billion to Britain and France, virtually the entire war cost for Britain and France over the course of the next 10 years in the Roaring Twenties. And then after that bill was paid within 10 years, they were going to be given a final bill. How much is that going to be? Nobody knew. Second of all, war guilt also will rankle even the most moderate of German thinkers. War guilt. Germany had to accept 100% of the blame for causing this war that took 15 million lives. This was completely unacceptable. This nation had never had a parliamentary democracy. Democracies are very fragile, as we know. And they're going to have one now, the Weimar Republic. But the Weimar Republic is going to have its work cut out for it. The population of Germany as the 1920s progressed is about 80 million people. The economy, as the economy here grew all the more unstable, especially out of control inflation in the early 1920s, Germans began to look for specific scapegoats. And the specific scapegoat group, the Jews. 40% of the Jewish population in Germany resided in the city of Berlin. Jews are an overwhelmingly urban people. We see it in the American experience. The most urban people in the United States with maybe the exception of African Americans. But you have here, you have a very significant concern going on here for the German Jews. Because first and foremost, in 1920, 120,000 copies of the Protocols of the Elders of Zion circulated in the nation of Germany. In 1921, they were proven to be a forgery, but yet another 210,000 were sold. Second of all, there were 430 ultra-nationalist and anti-Semitic associations in this nation of Germany by 1924. Third, by 1930, there were over 700 anti-Semitic periodicals in the supposedly civilized and cultured nation, the nation of Germany. A perfect storm was in fact brewing in this nation, a perfect storm. And on January 30th, 1933, Adolf Hitler and his Nazi party seized power in Germany. It was the end of this parliamentary democracy. Germany had known autocracy through and through, and now they have a demagogue in power, a high school dropout, a one-time unemployed house painter, Adolf Hitler. Well, for the mass murder of the European Jews to happen, you have to have three things. First, this legacy of Christian anti-Judaism, which morphs into modern anti-Semitism, the scapegoating, the longest hatred. Second of all, Germany's defeat in World War I. And third, the rise of Adolf Hitler and the Nazi party. If any one of those are not there, I do not see the mass murder of the European Jews 
taking place. Even then, as a modern Jewish historian, I don't get it. It makes zero sense to me. This should have never happened. Tragically, it did. Holocaust historian Raoul Hilberg warned the following. For as long as a group of people are not fully accepted into a society, they walk a tightrope between acceptance and annihilation. The nation of Germany came closer than human beings have ever come in the backdrop of the Second World War to creating hell on earth. In Russia, in 1917, we see our greatest example in the modern era of the mass murder of Jews. Begins in 1917 as Russia is still in this war before they surrendered to Germany. The Russian Revolution, the attacks would continue on the Jews in the Pale Settlement who are deemed inherently disloyal. And it intensifies during the Russian Civil War from 1918 to 1921. 60,000, 60,000 Jewish men, women, and children were murdered in Russia and Ukraine, which up until that time was the greatest tragedy in all of modern Jewish history. The Holocaust as is the case with so many genocides, especially in the modern era, it would begin, it would begin in the backdrop of World War II. It's very, very easy, or I should say it's much easier to engage in mass murder, to engage in genocide in a time of war. We see this in World War I with the Turks and the Armenians, the Turks slaughtering the Armenians, about two million Armenians. It continues onwards the greatest example, of course, of all of this is the mass murder of the European Jews. In a speech delivered on March 12, 1998, John Paul II, who was then the leader of the Roman Catholic Church, described the Shoah or Holocaust. And I quote, this century has witnessed an unspeakable tragedy which can never be forgotten. The attempt by the Nazi regime to exterminate the Jewish people with the consequent killing of millions of Jews. Women and men, old and young, children and infants, for the sole reason of their Jewish origin, were persecuted and deported. Some were killed immediately, while others were degraded, ill-treated, tortured, and utterly robbed of their human dignity, and then murdered. Very few of those who entered the camps survived, and those who did remain scarred for life. This was the Shoah, end quote. Nearly 70% of the European Jewish population was murdered between the years 1939 to 1945. Germany fought here these two wars in World War II, a war against the Allies for which Hitler had the German Wehrmacht, and the war against the Jews, a defenseless civilian population for which he had the SS. And countless European nations collaborated with the Germans and sometimes enthusiastically participated in the mass murder. There's a direct correlation in terms of the death rate in the Holocaust in various nations, proportionate death rate, and if the nations cooperated or not. You see an unbelievably high rate in Poland, France, and Italy, not as much. I'd say anti-Semitism in historic Italy was always fairly low. France was a different story, so it's oftentimes debated with the French if it was more of a case of French nationalism they didn't like to be told, or if it was a humanitarian thing. You have here this impact at the time would be very significant, and especially here in the aftermath, as countless 
American GIs, British soldiers would be engaged in the liberation of these concentration camps. The Soviet Red Army would be engaged here as well in the liberation of death camps, Auschwitz, the most prominent of them all. General Dwight Eisenhower demanded that there be photographers and film crews because nobody's going to actually believe this. Our most glaring example of the dangers of bigotry, the dangers of intolerance. And we see this in World War II in the assault against the European Jews. This hatred had reached its final solution as far as the nation of Germany was concerned. The long-term implications would prove horrific. What I'd like to do is stop there and to open the floor then for any questions that you may have. What we're going to do in part three of our three-part series is we're going to look at anti-Semitism in the post-World War II era. And we'll be spending, not just in terms of viewing historic Europe, it's going to be a, a, a smaller entity. We're going to look at the expansion of it, in particular to the United States, as well, and perhaps most striking of all, to the Middle East. And try and look at the present that we're in and projecting as well onwards into the future. Thank you. Great, thank you, Tim. So, um, um, maybe you. um, Tim, um, stop sharing your screen for now. Oh, sorry. So, um, yes, there there have been a few questions. So again, it's not too late to write a question. So, in the Q and A um, place, that's the place where you can write your questions. So there there are a few questions. So one question was. Um, uh, back when you were talking about Germany, um, and maybe this is a universal question, maybe it's not just about Germany, but someone asked if, if, if is anti-Semitism related um, to levels of literacy um, or degree of education in the period of time, the period of time that you were talking about? I, I would say definitely. I mean, it was a, an appeal most certainly from the perspective of the Nazi party to the lower middle class to the working class. Uh, um, from the perspective of Hitler, not one of his ideas was original. He borrows heavily from the anti-Semitic theorists that we already discussed earlier this evening, as, long, as well as people like Lance von Liebensfels, who talks about this struggle between the uh, Aryans and the hairy ape men uh, for, for global supremacy. So they, there is a, the upper echelon uh, of, the, of German society um, saw this as, as, as certainly, I mean, in, in fairness to the Germans, the Nazi party at its peak only has a support of 34% of the German population. Um, but once in the interest of law and order and in the interest here of uh, protecting the German nation, the constitution is suspended um, in 1933 following the, the Reichstag fire. Um, which uh, uh, takes place on February 27th of 1933, it's pretty much open season then. And a lot of people don't speak up. It was a sense of, of fear more than anything. And there's no doubt there's righteous Gentiles uh, um, in Germany. But for the most part, yes, I would say that this is, this is a case that the bulk of the attraction to this movement was of the very poorly educated, which you find in terms of white nationalist organizations in Europe in the present day, as well as uh, the United States. So there are actually um, a couple of questions about um, the activism of Emile Zola and the whole, um, the whole time of the, um, the, the, the Dreyfus affair. So mm -hmm. um, someone asked, how did the activism of Emile Zola reflect the attitudes of French society in general during the Dreyfus affair and a corollary asked about specifically other, um, other intellectuals like Georges Clemenceau, who was um, a writer, uh, a journalist, and later became the prime minister mm -hmm. of France. Um, so can you comment about the overall society 
of France during the time of the L'Affaire Dreyfus, as they used to say. Exactly. Well, what happens here is when Dreyfus is sent off, he, uh, um, he he's never going to be heard from again. He has no clue what's going on back in France. But as the four years progress, 1895 and 1896, this is still happening. Somebody with the exact same handwriting uh, that was used to accuse Dreyfus is still selling military secrets and uh, to the to the Germans. And it's uh, Ferdinand Esterhazy, who was a, a lout, he was a gambler, he had a ton of debts, uh, so on and so forth. And, and um, so he is arrested. And uh, basically what the French army does, the military tribunal is finds him not guilty. It's just not, not even anything. And this is what really, when this hits the newspapers, because uh, there's French uh, leaders in the high command uh, who uh, know that Dreyfus was in fact framed. And what they do is they start to say, we're going to speak out. Uh, and uh, um, their, the attempt was to silence them, but then they send out word to Zola, to George Clemenceau, as well as to Dreyfus, his brother Matthew, saying, listen, this is a huge scandal. He is innocent, 100%, and a guilty, uh, the guilty man was just set free, was just allowed to be free. So what it does is it really divides French society into the, the pro-Dreyfusards, or just known as the Dreyfusards, and the anti-Dreyfusards. And it gets really bizarre, because the military, of course, is very strongly anti-Dreyfusard. The Catholic Church gets involved. Uh, um, and why the Church gets involved this has nothing to do with them whatsoever. They get involved here on the side of the anti-Dreyfusards. And you have the French intellectuals who are stepping forward, uh, like Zola, and Zola publishes IQs, you know, basically of this huge cover-up. And it leads to uh, uh, a new trial for, for Dreyfus. And when he comes back four years later, he has no idea why he's being brought back to France. People were shocked. He looked like he'd aged like 20 years. So you do see in terms of, of and eventually justice prevails here for Dreyfus too. So it does play a very significant role in terms of the, uh, the intellectuals in France stepping forward because otherwise uh, nothing would have changed. Um, there were actually quite a few questions about the protocols of the elders of Zion. And just as an aside, when I was an undergraduate um, at the University of Wisconsin in Madison. I was in Celery Hall. And the guy who was across the hallway from me, uh, who came from a small town somewhere in Wisconsin, showed me his copy of the Protocols of the Elders of Zion. This was in the late 60s. Uh -huh. And he was a little confused because he was getting to know me and I didn't seem to be part of this great conspiracy which his whole family uh, believed in. So, so clearly this didn't just stop, you know, sometime in the early 20th century. But the questions are, um, you know, wanted um, to know, you had mentioned that this was a forgery. So what does that mean exactly? Who forged it? Um, do we know who, who wrote this as a forgery? And what does that mean exactly? And furthermore, someone else asked about the influence um, of the protocols of the elders of Zion, specifically in America and specifically relating to Henry Ford. Absolutely. So if you could make some comments sure. about all of these um, protocol questions. Um, the protocols were, were a proven forgery by 1921 and it was literally taken almost word for word in a very uh, a cheap knockoff of a play that came out uh, regarding uh, the emperor Napoleon III. Now Napoleon III, uh, is a descendant of Napoleon Bonaparte, and he is going to be in power until France loses to the Prussians in the Franco-Prussian War in 1871. But it's the stage is set at this at this time, and it's a case of well, how best to rule the world. Well, then the transition is made, putting it in Basel, Switzerland. Uh, so it comes forth in 1903. Well, lo and behold, this is where the Zionist Congresses are meeting. So it's tweaked slightly, but it's easy to see exactly where this comes forth and where, where it comes out of. And it kind of then takes on a life of its own and, and people believe uh, stupid things, uh, quite frankly. And Henry Ford is one of them. One of the major questions, and we'll get into American uh, anti-Semitism in part three, but one of the things that really perplexed 
uh, uh, so many American historians is looking at Henry Ford is why in God's name was he such an anti-Semite? No doubt about it, 100%. And you'd buy a Ford Model T in the Roaring Twenties, which was then in the aftermath of World War I, most Americans could afford one. Before that, it was a total luxury. Uh, before the First World War for your average American, and you would get a copy. Dealers were giving a copy along, buy a Model T, and get a copy of the International Jew. And the International Jew was literally the Protocols of the Elders of Zion. It was just a way of, you know, giving it a spin to make it more, uh, uh, more attractive. So it's something that doesn't go away. And I'm not sure if I, I referenced it when I was thinking about it earlier today, but... Uh, uh, but it still continues to pop up. Middle East, it's very prominent. Japan, uh, uh, as I referenced as well, uh, uh, it's, it's, it's also popular. It's just, it's so, it's so bizarre that it's still in essence hanging around, but so too, by the same token in the Middle East, you have uh, references made to Jewish ritual murder. So, uh, and you have ritual murder allegations, well, perhaps not surprisingly, uh, in Germany as well, all the way into the 1930s. So you mentioned, you know, other places. Someone asked a question um, about South Asia, what we would call the Indian Peninsula. Um, did, that seems to be an area of coexistence among Jews, um, Muslims, and, and Hindus. Um, could you comment about that? Yeah, it's, it's, it's difficult. I mean, you have these areas in terms of discern why is it a cultural perspective or uh, what is it that sets so some areas apart of being more tolerant as opposed to others? You have this as well in Europe in the Middle Ages where uh, these Jewish towns and hamlets, some areas in the Germanic lands were very, very tolerant and in some cases even protective of their Jews, uh, whereas other areas weren't. So in terms of the phenomena there um, as to why that is the case, uh, I'm not entirely sure. You do have it with Judaism, Christianity, and Islam in Southern Spain, uh, the so-called golden age of Islam, that there's a good deal of interplay and uh, existence. It's, I'd say it's more Jews and Muslims uh, than Christians, but the Christians by the same end, they, they borrow heavily in terms of philosophy at the time of Maimonides, and you have Averroes and Avicenna. Uh, Thomas Aquinas becomes this huge voice in Christianity, which maybe this leads to something of a, a uh, a, a calmer exchange, or a, I don't want to say a utopia by any stretch of the imagination, but something that would perhaps be a bit more of a civil society. As to why that is the case, I don't exactly know. Right. Um, so here's a question about, um, could you say something about the influence of the Great Depression on the rise of Hitler, the Third Reich, and of course, anti-Semitism of the Third Reich? What so the the, the stamp, yes, in, in, the, in the time of the Great Depression, uh, the United States is going to suffer more than any other nation in the Great Depression. The nation that suffers the second most, however, is the nation of Germany. And the United States, a, a nation that uh, I, I love with a tremendous passion, one thing, despite all our shortcomings and all our faults and all our weaknesses, and God knows there's, there's, we're the countless, no doubt about that, um, one of the really great things about this nation is at this time of extraordinary suffering that the nation itself was uh, very supportive of, of the status quo and moving forward and eventually getting out of this. I mean, Tom Brokaw refers to them as the greatest generation and for good reason. And even Franklin Roosevelt, when he takes over as president of the United States is stunned by this. And so you have this tremendous sense of of patience. Unemployment in the United States over the course of the 1930s never drops below 14%. But there's no extreme of turning to communism or turning to fascism. Oh, sure, you'll find identities, etc. there and support in some circles. But by and large, the middle of the road remains secure. The opposite happens in Germany. Germany crumbles literally like a house of cards. And it's for a, a number of reasons. And even when the economic recovery takes place in Weimar, Germany, from the years of 1924 to 1929, the Nazis are very confident this can't last. And sooner or later, the bottom is gonna fall out and we'll have our opportunity. It's a tremendous credit to the United States and uh, a tremendous shame, quite frankly, for the nation of Germany. But Germany didn't have a history at this stage of any sort of parliamentary democracy. So it is one of the more 
one of the more amazing aspects of American history. And it's a tremendous, tremendous credit to the uh, uh, American population. So here's another question. Was, what was the role of religious leaders in Europe in promoting or preventing attacks on Jews? Good question. It's a very good question. From the standpoint here of religious leaders, I think that with the onslaught, it happened so fast for Protestant ministers, for uh, uh, the Catholic Church, that it caught them off guard. And in fairness, to these religious leaders, as too is the case with, with many Germans, and I'm not being an apologist for the Germans, if you spoke out once this, this machine, so to speak, uh, uh, was in effect, was, had taken a hold on German society, uh, this Nazi machine, if, if you spoke out, you would be arrested, you'd be sent to a concentration camp. Um, so uh, you have countless priests, uh, as well as nuns, as well as uh, Protestant ministers. Uh, you look, for example, at, at, at Martin Niemöller, a classic case example. And there are these cases of, of people who did speak out and got in trouble. By the same token, you also have people who were wildly supportive, Protestant ministers more than Catholic priests, who were wildly supportive of the Nazi regime. So it depended on the situation um, across the board, and in, it's something that still there's a, a, a good deal of, of work that's been done on it, but again, it was kind of like, a, I would say that the awakening really takes place after the fact uh, for the Christian churches, and especially for the Catholic Church, and it impacts then other churches, but so it's more or less a, a mixed bag. More, so much more could have been done, but it's by the same token for the German Jews, the majority of them were able to get out. Uh, and this is true even after the time of the Kristallnacht, November 9th and 10th, 1938. So you have, especially Germans who were fairly young, uh, German Jews who were fairly young, and, um, were able to, to get out. The question for them was, where are we gonna go? Uh, which, which is also another major challenge. But by comparison, once the war begins and the walls close, it's the East European Jews who are going to be uh, in a, a, obviously facing total annihilation uh, once this formally begins, not really in 1939, I'd say more so in 1941. So I have two more questions that I'm going to relate. So the first one, I think uh, someone said, you know, mentioned that you really haven't talked much about anti-Semitism in the United States. So I'm yeah. going to make an assumption that you're going to mainly talk about that next week. Correct That's going to be very Yes. yes. <laughs> okay. And what it's what what's cool uh, is it for the from the Jewish standpoint, as a Jewish American, what it, what becomes very cool is that you're in this great melting pot. So if somebody tells you that you don't belong here, you're not an American. I mean, the only you know all of us, whether willing or unwilling, were transported from uh, some other place in the world, unless we're Native American, and so. It was something that it was easier, I would say, to assimilate. And the Jewish population is tiny, and we'll talk about this next week, in 1880. And the Catholic population was very, very small. It's a Protestant nation for Protestant people. And between 1880 and 1920, with those May laws being passed, the doors are going to be open. And you're going to have this huge influx of East European Jews, which the German Jews who are already in the United States didn't exactly welcome them with open arms uh, uh, by any stretch of the imagination. So, so in the 1920s, then it's the nativist response, which is so comical. The Ku Klux Klan is gonna come back to power. It's going to rise like a phoenix. And it's not just blacks and Hispanics uh, that it's focusing on. It's also Catholics and Jews uh, who are going to destroy our Protestant nation, our moral fiber. And what's interesting, I wish to God as, as a Jewish historian who's a Roman Catholic, that there was a, a, even a stronger sense of community between these two groups because there should have been. It was easier for Catholics because there are too damn many of them. They're 22% of the population by the Roaring Twenties. Jews were about 3% of the population. So, but it's something that indeed we'll get into. Um, and it's something that 
in recent past, and I know I started with Charlottesville, but it's still something I don't even like to get into because I just start becoming all the more enraged and, and disgusted. We are so much better than this as a nation. What the hell is going on here in the 21st century? We're so much better than this. So one final question. Um, someone asked about Bulgaria. Now, I, well, most of us don't really know, but Bulgaria was part of the Axis nations, of course, aligned with Germany. And actually they saved their Jews. In fact, there were more Jews in Bulgaria after the war than there were before the war. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, do you have, you know, what really, what do you think accounts for the behavior of the Bulgarians in really protecting and saving their Jews? That's an excellent question. It's something that's been uh, uh, discussed, uh, uh, you know, a, a great deal uh, as to why Bulgaria was, was more sympathetic, why they're more protective. And it comes down to, a lot of times it's, it's in terms of, is it the timing that they could see the war was shifting and that you wanted to basically not be, I, I would say it definitely impacted uh, Raul Wallenberg's work uh, uh, in, in Budapest in terms of saving that you didn't want to be accused of being part of this and considered here uh, a potential uh, a war criminal after the war. Um, if this got out, uh, that you didn't like being told what to do by the Germans um, uh, in general and following through on this policy or whatever the policies were. Uh, it could be cultural. To what extent it is, I'm not entirely sure, but it's something that uh, uh, the exact details of which uh, I'm going to look up more in detail and yeah. uh, as well and see if, uh, if there are actual exact reasons because um, it is, quite frankly, in Italy it's easy. In Italy, it's easy. The Italians have low anti-Semitism uh, uh, throughout. France, is it humanitarianism that they save Jews or is it because they don't want the Germans telling what to do? That's, uh, or is it a combination? Right? A different thing as well. I, I actually spent some time in Bulgaria, believe it or not. And I think that part of the influence was, um, you know, King Boris was sort of like on the fence about the whole thing. Mm -hmm. uh, but, um, the, the Bishop of, um, of uh, Sophia, who was, it was Eastern European, um, Eastern Orthodox, 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 you know, mm -hmm. he really took the lead. He just felt it was a Roman, I mean, it was a moral imperative to protect the Jews. I mean, oddly enough, Macedonia was actually, had been an occupied, occupied by uh, Bulgaria, and, mm -hmm. uh, and Bulgaria actually sacrificed the Jews of Macedonia, but not the Jews of Bulgaria. It's a complicated thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so, well, D Tim Crane, thank you so much. We've learned so much from you tonight. And thank I would- really. you know, my, my, my eternal sidekick. <laughs> <laughs> right. Great to see you as always, but it's a, a strange sort of environment now with uh, COVID-19, unfortunately. A lot and of Zoom and all these little squares of, of, of faces. And also <laughs> really thank you so much to Maureen Luddy and her family, to David and to Noah for really making this possible. This has been a delight and it's been something that has really enriched all of us. So thank you so much. Thank you. So we'll see you all next week. Thank you all for coming. Thank you. Thank you, Maureen. Thank you, Noah. Take care. Be well.